Hello everyone. Welcome to another day of Test New. Hope you guys are having a great day so far and got to learn a lot from all the sessions we have till now. If you don't know me, I am Mudit, one of the founding members here at Lambda Test and I lead the marketing here. Uh, and I would be host for you for this session. And joining me today is none other than the automation panda himself, Andrew Knight. He is a software quality champion and avid of supporter of open source platforms, also the playwright ambassador. And most importantly, he writes a pretty sweet blog at uh, automationpanda.com. Uh, when I started my journey with Auto Alamites nearly six years ago, this was one of the go to places for me to learn more about automation testing. So feel free to check that post as out. It's pretty neat stuff. Uh, today, Andrew is going to do a very deep dive into Python based testing. It would be a pretty hands on session, a lot of coding. So put your coding hats on or coding glasses on, whatever works for you. Uh, before, <laughs> before we get started, uh, you will see a QA and a section uh, in the right side of your window. So if you have any questions, feel free to add it over there and uh, we'll try to take them at the end of the session. There is a possibility that we may not be able to take all the questions, but uh, still feel free to add them. Uh, we have a Lambda test community thread going on as well, where we'll try to answer the rest of the questions that we miss out during the session. Uh, another thing that one of the most asked question is that this session would be recorded. You will be able to watch it again by clicking on the replay button in the uh, view session. And after end of this week, we'll be adding these uh, sessions recording over our YouTube channel as well. So feel free to subscribe there. Now, uh, yeah, that's one of it from my side. Andrew, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Moody. Thank you for the kind words. And hello, everybody. It's awesome to be a speaker here at this year's TestMU conference. Thank you, Lambda Test, for hosting. Uh, I, I greatly enjoy the relationship I've had with Lambda Test and all the people part of it for the past several years. So today we are going to learn how to get started with testing in Python. As many of you know, Python is one of my favorite programming languages. I think it's awesome in general, and I think it's awesome in specific for the purpose of test automation. Um, you know, you could do things in Java, C Sharp, whatever. I like to do them in Python because I believe simple is better than complex. Uh, Python has a very rich ecosystem of libraries and maintainers and just awesome people and community. And it, it, I love the syntax of Python because it is concise yet powerful. And you, you can basically do anything you want in Python. That's kind of the running joke is you can just import anything and it's there. So all these are great reasons why Python is a wonderful language for test automation. Um, and I'm just going to show you a few tips and tricks along the way. Uh, it would be helpful if you already know some Python, but if not, that's okay. Python's kind of like executable pseudocode. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, I see some hearts flying up. So let me share my screen and hope this works. We just tested it, but we all know how things go wrong. Um, first thing I want to share are helpful resources. Uh, if you want to dig deep and learn more in depth about testing with Python, I strongly recommend checking out Test Automation University. We have a whole Python testing path over there that takes you through everything from basic Python programming to PyTest, Selenium WebDriver, visual testing in Python, BDD in Python, robot framework, the whole gamut is there. So great resources for learning more. I've developed a couple of those courses myself. In fact, I recently refreshed the PyTest course, which is where a lot of my content for today will be coming from. So if we want to do testing in Python, what we have to do is uh, make sure that we have Python installed. I like to be very command line driven in my testing. And most likely, Python might already be installed on your machine. Uh, Mac OS comes shipped with Python out of the box. I know, wow, right? <laughs> To check your machine, you can drop down to the command line and, and type in Python dash version, or py maybe Python 3 specifically dash dash version. And so you can see here on my machine, I've got Python 3.9. I think the latest one is like Python 11. I mean, as long as, yeah, hearts. As long as you're doing at least Python 3.8, you should be good to go with most things. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't have to be on the absolute latest, just usually anymore you want Python 3.8 or higher. Absolutely, you want something better than Python 2. Python 2 is deprecated. Don't use Python 2 anymore. If you're, if you're stuck with it, I'm so sorry. You shouldn't be. <laughs> so uh, let's create a little project here. Uh, 
make deer test mu Python. And I'll open this project up in Visual Studio Code. Open code scratch, test mu project. This is all going to be live coding, friends. Uh, let me increase the font. Uh, yes, I trust the authors. Oh my gosh. Let's increase the text size so we can see it a little bit better. Duplo block size. So um, I like using Visual Studio Code for Python. Microsoft provides a very helpful extension. Where are my extensions? Let's make sure I have it installed. Python. Bam, here we go. So it is installed. If you don't have it installed already, it's just a click away. It's the, the Python extension for Visual Studio Code is maintained by Microsoft itself. So you know it's it's good to go. I think um, I think originally it was built by somebody else and then Microsoft was like, hey, we'll take that from you. And they were like, sure, right? But now it's part of the whole Microsoft tools thing. So it's good. Uh, so normally you'd probably be plugging into an existing project. I'm just gonna be creating a new project here. And specifically, we're going to be using PyTest as our test framework. Uh, there are a couple core test frameworks in Python. The one that comes with the standard library out of the box is called unit test, all one word, lowercase. Uh, unit test is very similar to any X unit style framework, whether it's J unit, um, N unit, whatever, right? I personally prefer PyTest because I think it has some unique advantages. You write tests as functions instead of test uh, instead of classes. It's leaner. Uh, somebody's in the chat saying PyTest is the best. Yes, it has a wonderful plugin framework, and I would say categorically PyTest is better than unit test. I'll die on that hill. So be it. It's okay. I wrote the TAU course on PyTest. I can get away with saying these spicy things. It's not that unit test is bad. It's just that PyTest is better. Bam, it looks like the people in the chat are agreeing with me. Right on, friends. Woo, yes, yes, give me some wows. Okay, so by convention in a Python project, when we add tests to it, we will create a new folder called uh, tests, and we put all of our test modules in here. So I'll put a new file in here and just say like test, I don't know, um, testbasics.py or something. Uh, we don't want to make this a Python package. We just want to leave it as like a, uh, a just a regular module. There are complicated reasons for that for the test. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, but ultimately, if I'm doing PyTest, I can do something like, you know, define test one plus one. It's just a function. In, in Python, we call functions with def. Um, and I could say something like assert one plus one, oopsie, equal, equal two. And there you have it, folks. That is a test and pie test. We're done. Congratulations. You can go on to the next session. <laughs> not quite. We're not done yet. It's okay. Don't leave me, please, please. <laughs> but in a sense, like this is with pie test, right? A, a function can be a test case. You don't need some complicated class. You don't need a whole bunch of crazy logic. It's just a typical function in Python using the, the assert command, which is also plain old Python. It works with the semantics of the language. Um, to run this, we will need to um, use a special command. And in fact, I probably need to install PyTest. <laughs> so um, side note, whenever you have a Python project, you should probably create a virtual environment for it. Uh, if you've done anything in JavaScript, it's kind of like NPM or like, you know, with, with Java, if you have a Maven project, how you have all your Maven dependencies in one place. A virtual environment is a local store of all the packages upon which your project depends. Rather than making it global for your whole machine, you can make it local for your project. So I am very low tech and low key with this. I use Python standard VNV module to create them. So Python dash, Python 3 dash M for run a module VNV. And now you give it a path name to where you want the virtual environment to be stored. I just want it stored in this top level in a folder called VNV. Ta-da! And now it's going to create that. Yes, make that for my workspace. So now you see this folder here, and it's got a whole bunch of stuff. We don't really have to worry about what's inside. But what I do want to do is I want to say uh, source 
VNV bin activate because I want to activate my virtual environment. Every time you use the virtual environment, you need to activate it. When you're done with it, you deactivate it. Uh, if you're running Windows, the command is a little bit different. You can you can look up the VNV module in Python uh, official docs to see exactly the command. It's I forget what it is. I think it's like a PowerShell thing or it's just like a batch file maybe. So, but it's in the same dang folder location thingy. Anyway, I'm going to activate it. And what you'll see is that usually in your terminal, now the environment name is in parentheses before it. So great, I'm in here. Once I'm activated in my environment, I can just start installing whatever the heck I want. So I can say something like, uh, if I want to install packages, I use pip. So pip install pytest. Uh, pytest is not part of the standard library. It is a third-party package with that unlike unit test, which is part of the standard library. What's the advantage of not being in the standard library? You can move faster, right? You don't need to wait for a whole language bump in order to add a new feature to it. It's not locked in place. You can you can develop and iterate and be agile and lean and all that good stuff uh, being a third party package. So yay, PyTest advantage. Okay, pip install PyTest, here we go. It doesn't take too long. Oh, I got to upgrade pip. Oh, screw that, we'll do that later. That's not important right now. So. Uh, from my root directory, anytime that I want to run tests, I would say python-m pytest. And it's usually good practice. Give the path to where your tests are. You can make it the, just the full tests directory. I could make it the actual test basics module, uh, whatever. If you don't give it a directory, it searches the whole of your project and looks for any test underscore module with, the, with functions starting with test underscore. All that's configurable, but usually we like to give it a path just to, so you don't have to search everything and be wasteful. So here we go, boom, bam, boom, bam, done. Look at that. We have run our first high test list. Not only did we write it in two lines, we ran it. Congratulations, <laughs> folks. How are we feeling? We feeling good? Giving wows, giving thumbs up? Yes, it's awesome. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I try to make it fun, right? I try to make it fun. So what we can see when we run PyTest is it gives us this command line output Right, we've got test session started. It, sh it dumps all of the, um, of the package versions of whatever it's doing. Uh, it'll show you how many tests it discovers or collects. And then it'll print out the uh, test module and it'll print a little green dot for every single uh, test case that passes. Uh, if I wanted to do this, I could be a little bit more verbose. I could say dash dash verbose option. And now instead of just giving a dot for each one, it'll actually print the name of each test. That's the, you know, the path to the module colon colon test one plus one and it's passed, right? So, and if you have like a hundred tests, those will just go straight off the page. Um, you can also do uh, quiet and you'll notice, oh, wow, it didn't give me any of that banner stuff. It just printed out dots <laughs> and then reported it at the end. So maybe you don't, maybe you're in CI, you don't necessarily need to puke out everything on the page because you're doing some other kind of reporting. You can make it quiet. Normally default is better. Um, uh, yeah, uh, never knew about dash dash verbose. Yes, that's why you're part of this session. Thank you so much for joining. You have your nugget of wisdom for today. Awesome. Okay, so this was a happy path and it wasn't really that interesting because like what's one plus one is two. Of course we know this, right? Uh, what happens when a test fails? We'll see PyTest really start to shine here. So I can say def test one plus two. I'm going to make this a little more interesting. I could say like, hey, A equals one, B equals two, C equals three, assert A plus B equals C. Now we know this one will pass, but let's let's deliberately be naughty. Let's say C equals zero. One plus two should not equal zero. So this new test should fail. A good test framework will not only fail gracefully, but help you get to the root cause as to why something has failed, right? Nothing is worse than seeing, hey, your test failed and being like, and what more can you give me? PyTest gives you a lot out of the box. So let's rerun the test. Oop, no, I don't want quiet mode. Sorry, friends. Uh, let's just do regular mode. Okay, here we go. And I'm going to pull out the terminal so we, we see more of the text here. So we ran the test. We see we had two tests, one green dot passing and one red F for failing. PyTest will print out a banner with all the failures, test case name based on the, the function name. So make sure you do, um, make sure you give good names to your test cases, right? So good code should be self-documenting. And so what it will do here is what is called assertion 
introspection. Say it with me, friends. Assertion, introspection. What it does is it looks into not just what failed, but why. We see a little printout of the code leading up to what happened. Okay, that's really cool for context. Uh, we can see what happens, and then it pinpoints the exact line where the failure happened. Okay, so it was this particular assert. The line it shows is the code, which is the ABCs with the variables. But notice what's going on in the line below that. Assert 1 plus 2 equals 0. The magic of assertion introspection is that it substitutes the values for what those expressions were. So we don't have to scratch our head and wonder what the values of A, B, and C were. We can see, oh, it's 1 and 2 and 0. Oh, right? Because normally we'd see uh, something failed and we have to go back and debug it ourselves and step through with the debugger, which honestly is a little painful in Visual Studio Code. You got to configure that yourself. Uh, if you want something a little more feature rich, you can try PyCharm. That's a whole other conversation. Both are good editors. But anyway, it's like normally what you do is you have to like debug and trace each variable and put a breakpoint. Why is PyTest not having it? PyTest is just like, yo, dude, bro, I give it to you here. You don't have to run it again. <laughs> Thank you, PyTest. It's amazing. And it'll tell you the kind of assertion or the kind of error that was. It was an assertion error. Any sort of exception will, will cause the test to fail. This is saying, hey, it was explicitly an assertion you called. And then, yep, it'll even show you that assertion introspection in the short test summary. Wow. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and you didn't need any sort of funky assertion libraries or syntax to do it. Assert is part of the Python language. This wasn't a special function. It wasn't something I created. It wasn't something PyTest created. It's just part of the language standard. Um, uh, if you were to use unit tests, the other Python test framework, uh, a unit, the unit test has like this whole collection of, of methods and stuff or like assert equal, assert not equal, you know, and you have to remember all that. No, dude, PyTest is like, no, we'll just hook into this and we'll do a search and introspection so that you can, you can be more Pythonic. You can be idiomatic to what the language intends you to do, and it's okay. That's another reason why PyTest is one of the best Python test frameworks. Isn't Python cool, Peeps? You dang right it's cool. Python is freaking awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for being active in the chat. Love it. Okay, so now that we've seen tests passing and tests failing, what else can we do with tests? Uh, there's us, um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's very common that you might want to parameterize your tests as well. You know, for example, I could, I could say something like, well, what if I want to test multiplication? You know, um, I could say something like test, you know, um, I don't know, we, we could spell out a whole bunch of cases here, like, Multiplication. You know, you might want to say something like, hey, I want to multiply just two positive numbers together, you know, like two times or three times four. You know, maybe I want to have something like identity property, one times anything. Maybe I want zero property, zero times something. Uh, maybe I want to try like a positive number times a negative number. Maybe I want to have two negative numbers. Oopsie, that's not a negative number. I don't know, stuff like this, right? You might have multiple cases where it's like the same logic that you're testing, but you want to, you know, parameterize. And so creating new um, uh, methods, or not methods, these are functions, creating new functions, one for each of these is kind of repetitive. You might be like, yeah, right? So what you might want to do instead is to parameterize. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to first start to write out my function as if it were just like a regular function, right? So our test function, test, Multi multiplication. Okay, and you know, typically I do something like assert, you know, three times four equals 12, right? I hope it is 12. Please tell me the universe didn't break today. Now, I will start with this base and I will start to refactor it into a parameterizable thingy ding. So what I see here are there are three values that need to be parameterized. The A, the B, and some sort of product value. So I'm going to put them as arguments in my test function. A, B, uh, products, I don't know. 
we said something like first or second, right? But eight times, whatever. Just we're, don't argue with my variable names. If you have a problem, just put it in the chat and be like, you should name it. I don't care. It's a, it's a little tutorial thing. Here we go. <laughs> so now I can say something like assert A times, oh my gosh, where's my cursor? B equals product. Yes, yes, this is very good, right? Okay, cool, that's awesome. So I have parameterized my test function for certain values that I want to test, uh, but now I need to actually provide values with or for these different um, parameterized inputs. And the way we're gonna do that is we're going to use um, a, a PyTest construct. So we also need to import PyTest at the top of our uh, module and because I've got it in my virtual environment, it should already be there. So what I want to say is, add a decorator, high test mark, parameterize, yay! And I make because I have control, I have Visual Studio Code, I have an autocomplete, yay! So there's two arguments I need to give. First one is a string list of the parameters by name, separated by commas. This will do the, the substitution. I know it seems a little janky, but just, just trust me on this, friends. So this will say, okay, I have three essentially columns or three, three names of parameters, and they have to match what my inputs are here. And secondly, I want to provide a list of tuples that will be mapped to those parameter names to inject into my function. So uh, we said three, four, and 12 could be like one particular set of test case values we want. Another one was like one times nine, which is nine, last I checked. And we could have like zero times eight, which should be zero. Yes, I hope so. I hope nobody's pulling out the calculator to verify these numbers because this is simple math, but it's okay if you do. No worries, negative 15. This is why we do testing friends because sometimes we get our lives wrong. Okay, negative seven times negative eight was what, ne positive 56, I hope so. Maybe I got it wrong. Maybe I'm talking smack and I shouldn't. All right, and so there, now we have a parameterized test. Um, <laughs> pi test mark parameterize, the variable names that map to the essentially like columns of my parameters, the list of tuples. And so this can be very data driven. And so if I run my test now, oh shoot, we never went back and fixed this test. One, two, three, okay. Let's try it again. Okay, so let's run this test now. And we should have three, pa oh, we have more than three passing tests, but all the tests are passing, right? We actually have seven tests. Why? Because these were one, two, three, four, five tests plus two is seven. We can do math. Yes. Awesome. So here we go. The pi test mark parameterize is a great way to handle the data driven concerns of testing. So uh, we could even be a little more clever if we wanted to be. If we wanted to pull these out, we could even say something like this um, uh, product params. Oh, uh, shoot, I should probably, I should do proper Python syntax. What do you think, friends? So I could even do something like this if I wanted my um, my decorator to be a little bit more concise or if I wanted to use that data in a different place. Uh, you could even you could even put this in like CSV files if you wanted to. I don't know why you would want to do that. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe your company has like super giant, scary spreadsheets that they just, from their business on. Maybe that's the case. If that is the case, then you found a perfect case for developing a new app and launching a whole new business model. But I'll leave that one up to you as an exercise. I like to put my data into my Python scripts. Sometimes CSV is okay. Spreadsheets are scary. So, and I can verify this will work, run it again, boom, and it still passes. So a little bit of refactoring goes a long way. Very, 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 very cool. Now you might be wondering like, hey, Andy, this is all well and good, but all you've done is you've tested things that don't even really need to be tested. Right, hmm. like this math arithmetic in, in the Python language. That I would hope that Python has unit tests for that. They surely do. I hope. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe they're just playing fast and loose. But that would seem scary. What the reason I'm showing you all this is because I want you to see like the, the mechanics of the PyTest framework first and foremost. What we see is that it's very concise. It's functions, not classes, um, and it's it, they they build features in and around idiomatic Python. So if, if you're new to Python, you'll probably think, wow, this is really beautiful, concise, readable syntax. It is one of the reasons I love Python. So let's do something a little bit more 
interesting, right? Um, let's actually do some uh, web UI testing, right? Uh, let's say we want to uh, write some tests for a website or something and make sure that we can navigate and play with web elements and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in Python, the way that I would do web testing these days, I would still be using PyTest as my core framework, but I, I would use Playwright for browser automation. I think Playwright is phenomenal. It's fast. The syntax makes sense. It supports multiple browsers. It supports multiple languages. Uh, it's a lot faster than Cypress, a lot faster than Selenium, has automatic weight built in. You know, there's just a host of advantages to doing it. That's not to say other tools like Selenium or Cypress are bad. They're all very good tools, but I personally do enjoy automating my tests in Playwright. And in fact, I disclaimer, I am a Playwright ambassador. So surprise, we're doing Playwright today. So if we want to do Playwright, we do need a little bit of extra setup. Uh, you can go to playwright.dev and see the whole instructions about what I'm going to do. Yeah, sunglasses. It's cool. It's awesome. So first thing we need to do is uh, we need to install another dependency. We need to install the uh, we need to install Playwright for Python. So pip install, and I'm actually going to install pytest-playwright, which is the pytest extension for Playwright, which will include the Playwright dependencies that we need for our project. I know there's a lot of P's and a lot of pull sounds today. Just, just roll with it. Python, Playwright, pytest, pop, 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 pop. It's great, it's great. So, da -da! okay, here we go. So it dependency is a bit heavyweight. That's okay, shouldn't take too long. Um, I'm actually using a relatively new machine today, so hopefully everything will go quick. Okay, and so if I pip freeze my environments, uh, we can see, yep, we got everything we need. See, Playwright is there. Playwright's up to 137? Awesome. I'm not paying attention to versions these days. That's probably not good. And so we have the um, PyTest Playwright plugin as well. That'll, that'll be a good advantage for us. Okay, so next thing we need to do with Playwright is that we will need to install the Playwright browsers. Uh, if you're familiar with Playwright, Playwright tests uh, browser projects, not full browser um, applications. So we're testing Chromium, not Google Chrome. We're testing WebKit, not Apple Safari. You can also test big Google Chrome and Microsoft Edge with the browser channel. Do you need to? I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, Browser projects will account for the vast majority of the cases you need. I'm not going to be getting into holy war arguments about the pros and cons of this. I'm just saying it's a leaner approach that is that offers slightly better developer experience. We're going to leave it at that. So to do that, I'm going to say playwright install because playwright should now be installed. And what it's going to do, hopefully not too slowly, is it's going to install the browser projects. There's three of them, Chromium, Firefox, WebKit, that gets you like 99.0% of all browsers use one of those three projects. So we should be good to go. Arun, big Playwright fan here. You go, man. Yes, Playwright fan. Awesome. Okay. Okay. We'll let that go. What we're going to do is we're going to... Um, we're going to make a new test module. We're going to call it test underscore test web stuff dot py. Why? I don't know. Naming is hard. Name your thing better than this. <laughs> um, but uh, when, uh, as I said before, when you create these test modules, prefix them as test underscore or suffix them as blah, 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 underscore test dot py. That way PyTest knows how to get it. So uh, here we go. Uh, new new web module, or sorry, new test module here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start prattling off some some playwright code here. Let's say uh, define a function test playwright homepage or something. Let's load up the playwright.dev homepage and make sure stuff is true about it. Why? Because we can. Okay. Now, I'm writing the word pass here just to kind of be a placeholder because Python doesn't have open closed squiggles for code blocks. If you ever want an empty code block, you can just put the password. Mm, excuse me. So with Playwright, um, er all interactions will happen through Playwright's page objects, which is going to be given to um, this PyTest function as a fixture. Uh, fixtures are really cool. They're kind of like setup and cleanup code, entry, exit logic kind of stuff. Um, if I have some time 
still by the end of the session, I'll jump in and try to show you exactly how fixtures work. But uh, essentially, um, there are some fixtures that are given to you either from PyTest itself or from PyTest plugins. And so Playwright gives you a page fixture, which gives you the page object through which to interact. Now, I like to um, be more explicit about my types. Oh, come on. So I want to make sure that, that the editor knows this is from the Playwright page class. And so to do that, I'm going to also need to import Playwright. So from playwright.syncapi import page, now I know that this page is meant to be a capital P page object. And so I can get all of my control space autocomplete going on here. Okay, so what do we want to do in here? We could say something like uh, page dot. Oh, hey, look, I have autocomplete. Uh, what do we want to do? Got to load the page. Page dot go to. I don't know why they use go to instead of navigate or something, but it just feels dirty. Uh, HTTPS colon slash slash uh, playwright dot dev. Sure, why not? We're cool. We can do it. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, uh, then we could say something like. Um, uh, expect, oh, we also need to include the expect function. So funny thing with Playwright, you know, previously with, with most PyTest test cases, we just want to use the assert keyword. Um, with Playwright, they actually encourage you to use their expect function for making assertions because that enables web first assertions with automatic weighting in there. So I could say something like expect my page to have title um, and what what is the, the playwright.dev homepage title? I don't even know. Let's go figure out. Uh, really? Fast end to end. I'm sorry, I'm checking. You know what, let's just do this. Let's just make a regular expression so I don't have to, I can say like a contains relationship import re and we could say something like regular expression compile because I know it's going to have the word play right in it, but there's a whole bunch of other words in there that I don't really care about. Well, what just happened? Oh, it, I fat fingered. Sorry. Okay, play right. Play right. Boom, boom. So now here we have a basic web test that loads a page and checks something on the page. All my browsers are installed, so I could say something like. Um, Oops, no, no, Python, run my test. Let's focus now exclusively on the web test and let's see what happens. So do to do, do, it's running and it didn't even pop up the window. It ran so quick, uh, but my web test passed in 2.9 seconds. That's really freaky fast. So here, what I'm gonna do, let's, let's do this. Um, to actually show it, I'm going to add an option called dash dash headed. And so now, whoa, did y'all see that? Let me do that again. That was 1.16 seconds. Did you see a thing flash up and go? Yeah, you saw it. So another thing I can do if it goes too fast, I can also add the dash dash slow mo and give it, I don't know, like two seconds, 2000 milliseconds. And now we can see. So now we can see the window popped up and bam. Isn't that awesome? Playwright was so fast. I had to explicitly slow it down so I could see what the heck it was trying to do. <laughs> right? Like, dang, I got to shift from Selenium to Playwright. They said it, not me. I'm just, I'm just showing the technology, right? Because like a Selenium test, you got to like wait for the whole browser to like load up and then you've got to like navigate and then you got to tear the whole thing down. It's very slow, um, comparatively speaking. That is another advantage of Playwright I should mention here while we're talking about this. So like with Selenium, you have to roll your own dice. You have to like set up the browser, set up the Chrome driver path, create it, quit it, all that. I, I wrote a module that is one, two, three, four, five lines, and I have a full web test. I didn't have to explicitly start the browser. I didn't have to explicitly quit the browser. It did it for me, right? It was given to me. That's what you call good developer experience. Am I right? I'm right, I know I'm right. Cause I'm showing it right here, it's evidence, it's great. Yeah, I see those sunglasses falling. Wow, this is absolutely 
Yes, yes. Um, and furthermore, another cool trick, like if I wanted to have multiple web tests here, um, with Selenium WebDriver, typically the recommended practice is that every single test would have its own WebDriver session, meaning its own WebDriver instance, meaning its own browser instance. So the test, every single test has to start a browser, do the things, and then close the browser, which that can add three, five, 10 plus seconds per test. With Playwright, all tests use exactly one browser instance. That's it. You have one browser instance. Each test to keep it isolated, though, pulls from that browser instance what's called a browser context, which is like an incognito session. So all the, the cookies, the stores, the session, it's all insularly protected, but it's very fast to create and destroy those sessions or those contexts. So you don't have this start up and shut down uh, logic happening per test that is super heavy. It's very light, but still safe. And most times you don't even need to worry about um, work, working directly with the context because from a context, you can pull one to many pages. Most tests you only ever need one page. And so here I didn't have to specify browser or context. I specify page, which behind the scenes works with context and browsers, again, handled for you. So that's, that's really, really nice. Uh, if I wanted to uh, keep going with, with this whole, um, Playwright testing, if I wanted to, to go even farther, um, I mean, I could, I could try to verify that like there's a title on the page or something. So I could say something like, you know, expect page.locator, uh, what, what do we have? Um, no, 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 maybe not locator, but maybe get page, get by text, play, oopsie, oopsie. Playwright, I don't know, uh, the, uh, to be visible, something like this. Oops, no semicolons in Python. So here what I'm saying is, hey, like there should be some web element on the page that has the text Playwright. Expect that I can find that element and it should be visible, right? Very, very dumb kind of test, right? Normally you probably want to be clicking buttons and stuff, but I'm literally playing fast and loose with code here. So let's see, but I just want to show you how this is a way that you can use locators to interact with elements in Playwright. So this is a special kind of locator. It looks up things by text. In Playwright, you can use XPath, CSS selector ID, um, role uh, placeholder text. There's a whole bunch of helpers. So if, if I run this again, uh, I'm not going to do slow-mo. I'm just going to do it super fast because, because, because I can. Oh, that didn't do the thing. Oh, there was no element. Okay, so that failed spectacularly in my face. Hmm. What does the error say? This is horribly unexpected and unscripted. Uh, timeout five. So it's saying that it wasn't visible. That's okay. Um, I'm not gonna worry about this because we're, we're quickly running out of time. Um, we'll just comment this out for now. If I wanted to, I could, I could dig into that and, um, try to figure out more. I was trying to be tricky. Didn't, didn't work out too well. That's okay. But all that to say, you can use PyTest or you could use Python to test pretty much anything. You know, unit testing, API testing, web UI, mobile, desktop, like what, whatever you, you want to test this year. Um, I'm, I, all I can show in 45 minutes is just a, a very, very little bit of goodness and stuff. Uh, if you want to learn more, definitely check out those TAU courses that I showed. Um, and in what appears to be the five minutes we have left, uh, let's, let's take some questions here. As I say, whoa, I've been ignoring questions. Okay. So I'm going to pop them off from the top down to the bottom based upon the upvotes. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. All right, let's do this. How do you write effective test cases for Python code? I think we just showed that. <laughs> if you wanna learn better practices, take the TAU courses. Um, what are the best practices for writing test cases in Python? That's kind of the same question. Okay, I hope that we, we, we got that. I guess I could answer more broadly, like in general, not just Python, but any, any tests, functional tests. Follow the arrange act assert pattern. Arrange the stuff for setup act on the target behaviors and assert the outcomes. Okay, so what else we got here? 
What are some common challenges you face while automating tests in Python? Um, I wouldn't say that there's any challenges unique to it being Python. I mean, what might be the case is I know not as many people are familiar with Python as they might be with Java or C Sharp or other languages. Um, so maybe that there's some, some issues there. Maybe some people will not write idiomatic Python. Um, you, you do need to, I, I also recommend uh, use, use type hinting in Python. Python is a dynamically typed language, not a statically typed language. So you can get into trouble. Make sure that you add these types so that you can have things like autocomplete. All right, uh, what other questions do we have? Uh, let's see, here's one from Vaishali. What are the advantages of using a test framework like unit test compared to writing test scripts from scratch? Oh my gosh, I would never write test cases from scratch, right? Uh, test frameworks are one of the greatest things you have for test automation because they provide structure, they provide um, uh, ways to, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> they provide the structure for how to write a test case. They provide the runners for executing the test case. They provide a common um, um, design and understanding of when and where and what test cases are supposed to be and what they're supposed to look like, right? Um, it, in fact, in the, I'm writing a book on um, uh, the way to test software. And in one of my chapters, I show first steps with automation of just writing writing a test in just some hodgepodge script and then slowly starting to refactor that into a formal test framework and showing you all the advantages why you would want to do it that way. Um, I, I would never not use a test framework for functional testing. Okay. Uh, we still have a few minutes, right? Moody, let's see if we can knock out even more of these questions. Uh, in terms of extensibility and customization, how do test frameworks like PyTest enable developers to create tailored testing experiences? Um, that's actually one of the nice things about PyTest versus unit test. Um, a good test framework like PyTest will have a way to extend it or to provide plugins for it such that you can do idiomatic things within that framework. Perfect example is what I just showed with Playwright. So Playwright is its own library that, that is for browser automation. But the PyTest Playwright plugin that I installed adds um, all these nifty little hooks and command line options and fixtures to make the use of Playwright within PyTest even better. So like this, this page fixture that I showed, you know, when I put that as an argument in my test function, that was a fixture that came from a PyTest plugin, right? Or when I tried the dash dash headed option or the dash dash slow-mo option. Those were command line options added by the PyTest plugin. And so those are things that are specific to Playwright, but they're added to PyTest through the plugin. So it's, it's like PyTest almost naturally can handle those things too. And so that's, that's one thing that's really good about PyTest uh, as a, a test framework. Great question. Okay, so uh, next one. Uh, Yogendra, uh, what limitation have you seen in PyTest compared to Jasmine or TestNG? None. None. I haven't seen any limitation. Um, I will. I will go. I will be so bold to say. You can quote me as the automation panda on this. I think PyTest is the best core test framework available out there in any language. It is certainly my favorite test framework in any language, with a close second being Specflow. But, but to be, be even bolder, I think PyTest is the best because of some of its design decisions, because of how it handles fixtures, because of how it treats simple as better than complex, because of how it structures test cases as functions and not test classes, right? I could, I, I could diatribe on a whole list of reasons. Come meet me up for virtual coffee after I can, I can go through the whole thing and shred it up. <laughs> I, I bonify, I freaking love PyTest. I think it's phenomenal. Okay, so what other questions we got here? Um, will you start a Twitch and stream this kind of content? Huh? So um, I'm hoping either later this year or early next year, I might be doing something cool like that. So keep your eyes open on this. That's too uh, late. You have to start it. You have to start it. Oh, that's, that's what these conferences are for, man. <laughs> so I, I don't know about y'all. I'm having a great time out here. This is great. Okay. Um, we already answered that one. We already answered limitation. Um, 
Does Python work with most of the testing frameworks like Cucumber, Playwright? Yes. Yeah, so we showed Playwright. Uh, you could you could do um, uh, Gherkin type things with with Pytest. Uh, there's an extension called or a plugin called Pytest BDD, where you can write your your scenarios and give them one then plain language and then hook it in with test modules. Um, so that I in fact one of the TAU courses is on that. So, um, wow, we are already at, at time. Um, so I, I'm sorry I couldn't get to all these questions, but uh, this has been great. I hope it's been helpful for you. I hope it's been also somewhat entertaining. I can only scratch the surface. Feel free to reach out to me, automationpanda.com, if you wanna, if you have more questions or whatever. Um, Moody, thank you so much for hosting the session. I know I've dominated it with my own blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, but is there anything you wanna say? Yeah, that's what we were here for, Andrew. Like, uh, it was really insightful session, and me, a complete uh, automation noob, was able to follow each and every step. I had now have PyTest installed and everything it all set up. So that was pretty in, uh, both informative and entertaining. So right, really honored to have you here as well. And uh, again, looking forward to your both uh, the blogs you are gonna post, the book we are waiting for it, and now the Twitch channel. <laughs> Uh, rest Thank of the you. folks, uh, the session is, as most of you have been asking, is being recorded. Uh, you can watch the recording of this when you click on View Schedule button up. And we will also be sharing this on our YouTube channel at the end of this week. So stay tuned over there. Uh, we have next session. I think it's already started up. So feel free to join over there. And... Uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you guys had a great time, and see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.